Hi, welcome to the Newman Bond. My name's Laura Hartley, and I'm the Director of Annual Giving here at Newman University. And today I'm going to talk to you about a couple sports figures from Kansas that you might not be aware of. So before I get talking to you about these people, I wanted to give a little background about myself and why I'm talking to you today about these sports figures. So like many Kansans, I grew up loving sports and playing sports. Um, I still love sports to this day, but man, when I was a kid, I absolutely adored sports. I played volleyball, I played basketball, I played softball, but my favorite was always basketball and I loved Michael Jordan. I was a kid of the 90s, so of course I loved Michael Jordan and I wanted to be like Michael Jordan when I grew up. Um, I thought I was gonna play basketball forever. I thought maybe I could coach in the NBA. Unfortunately, uh, that dream was shattered by the time I was a freshman in high school and I got cut from my freshman basketball team. Very sad. Um, Unlike Michael Jordan, who got cut famously from his high school team and used it as fuel to become better, I promptly gave up on the idea of being a sports star and instead really fell in love with history. So I went to school, um, I went to college and got a history degree, and then I went on and got a master's in public history because I wanted to work at a museum. When I was in grad school, I found the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame that's located in Wichita, Kansas. I started volunteering there as a student. And then when the time came for me to graduate, uh, an open position had come available and I took it. So for 10 years, it was my job to tell the history of Kansas sports. And I met people who came to the museum. I traveled around the state talking about Kansas sports figures. It was a dream job and it really enabled me to shed a light on some of these people that have amazing stories that they're just not as well known as a Barry Sanders or a Darren Dreyford. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about three people um, who really had great careers in sports um, and they're all from right here in the great state of Kansas. Now the first one I'm gonna talk about is Janelle Carson Smith. Janelle was born um, in 1947 to Helen and Mead Smith in a little town called Fredonia, Kansas. Now, 1947, Title IX hasn't been passed. Very few schools have sports programs for girls. It just wasn't done at that point. There was really a focus on women being feminine and playing sports was not a feminine activity. Now, luckily for Janelle, she had a father that noticed that she always hung around when her father coached her brother in track and field. So one day he started coaching Janelle and it turns out she was pretty awesome at running. Um, she was doing a fantastic job and he continued coaching her. And by 14, she was competing in national tournaments where she was beating women 18 to 12 years her senior. So by 14, she is a world-class athlete and she starts traveling the world um, going to track and field meets. In 1962, at the Missouri Valley AAU meet, she set a world record in the 220 yard dash and qualified for the Pan Am Games in Brazil. She was a two-time AAU national champion in 1964 and in 1965, and she set an American record in the 400 meters with a time of 54.7 seconds, which was enough for her to qualify for the Olympics in 1964, which were held in Tokyo, Japan. So imagine you're a 14-year-old girl and then between 14 and 17, you're traveling to Brazil, you're traveling to Japan, you're traveling to Europe, all over the place having great experiences. You're from tiny Fredonia, Kansas. Um, that was Janelle's life during high school. 
Now, unfortunately, she did not win any medals at that 1964 Olympics, but she did have that experience. Um, she also has the distinction of being the only female athlete from Kansas to ever be on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Um, she was on the cover in 1965, and um, they wrote about her experiences being a track star in a world where women just did not compete that much in sports. Um, she used to do exhibitions in Fredonia. Um, people just loved her. I mean, she was a hometown hero if there ever was one. So Janelle Carson Smith, um, a great figure to be admired here um, from Kansas in the track and field world. We've had some great athletes in the track and field world, um, but Janelle is definitely one of them. Now, my next person that I'm going to talk about is another female athlete, and she is one you do not want to mess with because she competed in shooting. Now, for those of you that don't know, shooting competitions are very stressful. They take a lot of concentration, and you have to have a lot of perseverance. Uh, you shoot for three different positions, standing, kneeling, and prone, which is basically like laying down, and you shoot 40 times. She shot at a target that was four, 50 meters away um, at a bullseye that was about three quarters of the size of a dime. So you're literally shooting at something tiny. If you're off by one fifth of a thousandth point, I don't think I said that right, but you, you know what I'm saying, you will miss your target. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy how hard it is to be a good shooter. Um, like Janelle, Margaret's first coach were, was her father. He taught all of his kids to shoot on their family farm in Barrington. And by age 11, Margaret was shooting competitively. She went to college at Kansas State University um, where she was a two-time Big Eight Conference champion, was a two-time All-American, and became the first woman to ever win a uh, letter, a athletic letter from K-State. Um, after college, she continued her shooting career. She won 27 international competitions and 28 national competitions. Of those, 29 were in open competition. So that meant she was competing against both men and women and dominating both. She also set 13 world records during this time. And in 1967, um, I'm sorry, 1976, she was the first woman to compete for the US uh, in the Olympics um, as a shooter. So a huge distinction for, for Margaret Thompson Murdoch, first female, and she did fantastic. Her and another US um, shooter, Lanny Basham, were neck and neck throughout the competition. The competi competition actually ended in a tie, but unfortunately, back then, the way they decided who would win a tiebreaker is they just took the points from the last round. So Lanny had more points in the last round than Margaret did, and he was awarded the gold, and she was awarded the silver. Not really the way anyone wants to end a competition. It's basically on a technicality. So what they ended up doing is um, when they had the medal ceremony and the national anthem started playing, Lanny pulled up Margaret and they stood on the gold platform together while the U.S. National Anthem was playing. And again, I think this just shows how much camaraderie is in high-level sports. And regardless of race, religion, class, sex, um, if you're competing at that level, you really have respect for each other. So that's Margaret. So we've got two women, and my final person that I'm going to talk about is a wrestler. His name is Pete Marringer. 
So Pete was born in the 19-teens to German immigrants. They lived on a family farm in Kinsley, Kansas. There were 10 kids in their family. Pete was the youngest. And Pete decided to learn to wrestle really out of self-preservation. So um, he would get beat up by his older brothers. And he decided he was fed up with that. He was going to learn how to defend himself. So he saved up $3 and sent off for a correspondence course that promised to teach him how to wrestle in six easy lessons. So he took that and he studied it and he became a world-class wrestler. When he was in high school at Kinsley, he won two state championships, one in 1928 and then another one in 1930. It's kind of interesting about the one in 1930 and the story I always used to love to tell is, so Kinsley is 109, 190 miles from Manhattan, Kansas. Um, the school told Pete in 1930, we don't have the money to send you to the state tournament. His parents definitely didn't, trying to raise 10 kids. So Pete did what any resourceful kid of the 1930s would do. He put out his thumb and he hitchhiked 190 miles to the state tournament. He won that year a state championship. And then he hitchhiked his way all the way back to Kinsley, Kansas, so he could go back to school and get his chores done. Um, you know, nowadays that would seem kind of crazy, but for the 1930s, it was just what Pete had to do. And again, this just shows the determination that some of these people have to be the best. Uh, after high school, Pete went to um, Kansas University he got both a wrestling and a football scholarship and did well in both sports, but he still really excelled in wrestling. So in 1932, he decided to try out for the Olympic team. He got himself to Ohio and he tried out for the team, but unfortunately he lost his last match. But the coach was so impressed with Pete's grit and determination that he told him, if you can lose 17 pounds in 12 days, we will let you be on the team and you could come to Los Angeles where the Olympics were being held and you can compete. Well, that is exactly what Pete did. He lost the 17 pounds. He went to LA to compete against the best of the best. Now, just a little bit about the Olympics in 1932. When we think about the Olympics, we think of a lot of pomp and circumstance and huge stadiums and lots of people. You have to remember 1932, we're in the midst of the Great Depression, so people don't have money. And at that point in, the, um, in history, Los Angeles was not this booming metropolitan place that we can see it is now. Um, think about if you're, say, an athlete from England and you want to go to the Olympics in 1932. This is what you would have to do. You'd have to get on a boat, go all the way across the Atlantic. That would take a couple days, maybe a week. Then you'd have to get on a train and take the train all the way across the United States to get to the Olympics. Um, so it was really, it was an unusual Olympics in the fact that it was hard to get to um, and there wasn't much of an infrastructure yet. They did have these little huts that they put up for the athletes and um, it was the first time that they really had an Olympic village. But Pete wasn't really concerned about the pomp and circumstance of the Olympics. He just wanted to win a gold medal. And that was exactly what he did. He lost the, the 17 pounds in 12 days. He beat the reigning gold medal holder. He beat the best of the best in all of the world. And he won a gold medal, which is now at the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame. So if you ever want to see it, you can go to the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame 
in Wichita, Kansas and go check it out. Um, but Pete's journey doesn't really end there. After he wins the gold medal, he goes back to KU for a couple years and then it decides he wants to become a professional athlete. So he becomes a professional wrestler, travels the world wrestling. And when you think about professional wrestling in 1930, think of it as a cross between the Hulk Hogan, the Rock, that kind of theatrical wrestling wasn't exactly the wrestling of today, but it was theatrical. Um, and Pete did that for a while. He then decided to be a professional football player. He had a history with playing football. He actually played and was making $125 a week in the middle of the 1930s. This is insane when you think about most people during that time, the average salary was about $28 a week. So Pete was cleaning up, but he kind of realized by the end of the 1930s that he, his body could not sustain being a professional athlete for that much longer. So at this point he lived in LA and he decided to try his hand at the movies. The movies and Hollywood was getting really um, building up during that time. So he became a professional stuntman and he um, w was in really some outstanding movies. He did stunt work for Bob Hope in a movie called Road to Zanzibar, which was a Bob Hope, Bing Crosby buddy comedy movie. Uh, he also was in the Newt Rockney story, Newt Rockney All-American. And that movie from 1940, it's kind of claim to fame is that his co-star in that movie was none other than Ronald Reagan, um, future president of the United States. So that's Pete's story. It's Margaret's story. It's Janelle's story. Those are just a few of the athletes from Kansas that have such tremendous stories and it's so fun to share them with you. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope uh, you come back for another episode of the Newman Bond. Thank you so much. <music>